Justin Hawkins writes again. Good day to you. It is I, Justin Hawkins. This is Justin Hawkins Rides Again, my YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and sign up for the alerts. Um, yeah, it's exciting stuff today. Um, the first thing I'm going to do, actually, is talk about the jingle that I've been doing at the beginning and end. It was just something that I played on a piano and sang along to the first time I did it, and it's just stuck. Um, and it's dividing people. Um, there are some concerns about how high my voice goes at the end, so I can do you know, the lower version of it, which is Justin Hawkins writes again. And a few people have um, recognised that there is a similarity between that and, you know, stairway. But um, I think that this descending is quite common. Um, Don't want to leave you now. You know I believe in hell. It's that one. Or there's, um, tell everyone that I am sorry, truly sorry. You know, the Todd Rundgren thing. Um, and I'm singing along with the, the arpeggio of an A minor chord, which is not what Robert Plant does. You know, he is obviously, there's a lady who's sure that glitters his gold. Um, so, in fact, the melody is different, um, but the chord is just an A minor chord. It really is. But then it goes to this ninth, which I think sounds like the second note in the guitar part because it's accompanied by the descending, like goes from A to G sharp. So, in fact, it's slightly different. The relationship between this and this is different to the relationship between this and this. A musicologist will tell you that there's nothing to concern yourself with. But I could actually change the melody so I'm not singing along with the... You know what I mean? So I could go... Justin Hawkins Justin Hawkins writes a... But I like this note. Justin Hawkins Okay. Justin Hawkins No. Justin Hawkins Ooh, that's nice. Justin Hawkins Right, sir. Justin Hawkins. Justin Hawkins. Right, sir. It's not as catchy, though, is it? I'll stick with Justin Hawkins. Right, sir. I think the secret is not to do this. The temptation now that people have said stairways to go Justin Hawkins. Right, and then hit this. But I'll just stick with the A minor. Justin Hawkins. Right, sir. Sorry, I'll stop going on about that now. Um, okay, so today I'm doing Muse, and that's obviously an exciting moment because a Muse release means a great stadium rock band has done something, and it requires my attention. Let's have a look. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my relationship with Muse. Like, I was not an enthusiast. You know my feelings, I think, about effects pedals. When I play live, I just use an amp. I rely on my fingers. I have sometimes a channel switcher. And if I use anything, it's usually a delay, perhaps a noise gate um, to you know, help with some of the interference caused by my wireless system. But I really do like to keep it simple. And I feel the same way about vocals as well. Whenever a producer has tried to treat my vocal and put anything like a distortion or some sort of phase effect on it, it's made me feel really self-conscious and, and fake, really. It's, it's my own kind of dedication to... You know what? I just like to hear voices and fingers, and I'm not really. I get put off by effects, really. I, I, I used to be the case, anyway. So, Matt Bellamy is a great singer. His his mid range is really beefy and powerful. But I think when he when he hits the sort of higher stuff, which is the register that I tend to operate in, um, I think he he loses a lot of volume and, and, and in the olden days when you used to see him on TV shows and stuff, I, I didn't, I wasn't, I never saw them live until about 2004 and then I saw them live a lot. Um, but what I noticed was that when he was doing stuff in the higher register, he would move from one microphone, which is just a standard, not an SM58, he uses something else, but I've forgotten what it is now. And he would go to another microphone, which had like um, probably a lot of compression, probably a noise gate, because if you're standing off it, it's going to be picking up the drums and all sorts. Um, and some sort of uh, overdrive or some, some, some sort of gain, um, gain manipulation to, to give it that sort of 
edge and, and beef that it would need to get over the sound of the band. And to me, at the time, as a, as a sort of purist that only wants to hear voices and fingers, it, was, it rang a little bit like cheating, you know. And so I, I kind of dismissed them a little bit, and that was wrong. Um, the album that completely changed my mind was Black Holes and Revelations. I just think that's astounding. I think it's an incredible record. And, and I always say that if you're going to listen to one Muse album, that should be the one. Um, so I got into Muse and I was actually a huge fan. I think the drummer's amazing, bass player's amazing. Matt Bellamy's obviously eerily talented and is, comes from music stock. I think his father was in, what was that band called? The, um, the, one, the band that did Telstar. Um, so I think he was one of the first. Uh, it was one of the first UK recordings that um, went to number one in America. Made a lot of uh, made a lot of headway into uh, putting the UK on the map when it came to uh, the way the Mer- the Americans perceived our music. Um, so obviously, there's a lot of reasons to love Muse. Um, we were label mates. Um, we toured together in 2004, and I saw them play a lot. and And I do love this band. Um, having come to terms with the, you know, the the way they choose to treat some of the stuff, and I've actually come to appreciate the fact that, you know, his guitar has been modded using technology that I would never think to do. You know, there's a I think there's a chaos pad underneath the strings, creating all kinds of weird sounds. He doesn't sound like anybody else, and and that makes him obviously unique and obviously distinctive as well you can hear a muse song a mile away and you know it's them and that's i can only say that that's a brilliant thing um so the new song is called won't stand down and muse have produced it themselves i think they probably i I know at one point they were working with um even when they were self-producing to one of the engineers that they used um was Adrian Bushby, and he's a guy that we used on to, to he actually produced uh, Pinewood Smile for the Darkness, and he's amazing. Um, so he's really great at getting awesome natural drum sounds, and I think that's that's the, you know, that was the foundation of a Muse song, it was just a brilliant bit of engineering, really imaginative production, and of course the songwriting, which is distinctive. Um, some people dismiss it because it's sort of derivative of you know, classical music from a certain period. But um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So let's have a listen to the song and then I'll try and react to it as we go along. Okay, there's a brilliant sort of pre-music vignette stuff of, of, I would imagine that's Matt Bellamy with some kind of facial prosthetics to make him look 100 years old, sitting in a chair, being pushed along. There's hooded characters. It's really spooky and just so brilliantly shot. It's great. His eyes are so weird. <laughs> oh my god, it's terrifying. I never believed that I would concede and let someone trample on me. Oh, cool. So it actually reminds me of um, some of the Imagine Dragons um, music that we were talking about a few, a couple of weeks ago, I think. Um, it has this. Um, and then you think it's going. Which would be uh, somewhere. Uh, my guitar's probably not in tune. It sounds like it might be a B. Hang on. Okay. But crucially, if it was, if it was on the one, it's my life. It could be that, but it's not. It's the first one appears before the one, so the second one is on the one. So. It's good. Like this is the sort of pedaling note here. And the melody sort of jumps to uh, a D. And then it goes to. I never believed that I would concede and get myself blown asunder. Love it when it goes to that because then it's sort of in his upper mid range. That's where I think his voice really roars and sounds amazing. And that's pretty high for a male voice anyway. The time signature completely changes to a and they, they write great riffs. Yeah. 
want to stand down the See that's that is a musism in itself. It reminds me of that song. Together we're invincible. Okay, so the won't stand down thing. This when I whenever I hear stand down, I always think about that um, the address that uh, when when. Uh, when um, Donald Trump was addressing the Proud Boys and saying, we love you and all that. And <laughs> so stand down and stand by. So stand down, I suppose, means just holster your weapon, await further instruction. But this guy, the, muse, the Matt Bellamy's character that he's singing in is, is saying that he's not going to do that. So he says, I never believed that I would concede and let someone trample on me. You strung me along. I thought I was strong, but you were just gaslighting me. Gaslighting. I love that expression. That's when you, um, that's a, it's a type of relationship abuse, isn't it? It's when somebody behaves abhorrently. And then when you pull them up on it, they tell you you're mad. That's, that's what gaslighting is. I think I opened my eyes and counted the lies. And now it is clearer to me. You were just a user and an abuser. So I was right. Um, <laughs> not that it's a competition living vicariously. So when you live vicariously, that means that you you witness, um, you just derive all of your sort of pleasure and, and experience from other people's um, behaviours, really. You're just a user and an abuser living vicariously. Oh, okay. I never believed that I would concede and get myself blown asunder. Wow, so that's... It's, usually you hear torn asunder, that's when... Basically, you're ripped apart and blown asunder presumably means you're blown apart. It's ex much more explosive, obviously. You strung me along. I thought I was strong, but now you have pushed me under. He's great, isn't he? I opened my eyes, counted the lies. Now it's clearer to me. You're just a user and an abuser, and I refuse to take it. I love the defiance in Matt Bellamy's lyrics. It's always so good. He's, he's a great revolutionary writer, but I, I, I find a lot of his stuff very broad. But you kind of... Whenever they release something, there's always something in the world that you can associate it with. It's sort of quasi-political a lot of the time. Um, and then and then he uses sort of expressions that you could almost hear in a Tom Petty song. Won't stand down. Obviously, it won't back down. I'm growing stronger. That sounds like every gay anthem I've ever heard. And, and I've heard a few of them. Um, won't stand down. I've... I'm owned no longer. This is a freedom song. Won't stand stand down. You've used me for too long. Now die alone. <laughs> and then it goes mental. So then it's the big riff. Um, I'm coming back. Counterattack. That's good. So yeah. let's have a let's have a look at. I mean, it's obviously a great lyric. Um, just just vague enough to be able to associate with political climes and or even um, you know the stuff about abuse and things, you could also transplant that into a lot of relationships. In the video, um, the the character that is playing, I, I'm assuming it's him, It's he's sitting in a chair and, it, and he seems to be a puppeteer of some sort. There's some kind of device on his hand with cables coming off it. So I think he's like a, a space age puppeteer and then all the sort of people around him are doing his bidding. And it really reminds me of a scene in that movie, uh, what's it called? Um... This must be the place, the one where uh, Sean Penn is playing like an Irish goff and he visits uh, David Byrne and David Byrne has got this weird contraption with things attached to his fingers that operate strings. He's wearing a white suit, much like this. The, the, aesthetically, it's, it sort of has an echo of that, of that movie. Um, and, but, you know, when David Byrne's doing it, he's, I think he's playing a piano when he does that. I haven't seen that film for a while, but this is what it reminds me of. The riff's awesome. Yeah, it's cool. Amazing. Right, when you hear that riff, you just know that when they play it in a stadium, it's going to take off. It's awesome. And <laughs> in a way, it's kind of like um, the way it changes colour and goes to that straighter time signature with a massive riff. It's kind of like um, if I was to imagine dragons, I'd be like, oh, fuck, what didn't I think of that? Because it's kind of like it justifies all that skippy stuff in the in the verse. It really does. It actually... Actually goes, and now we're going to rock. Hold on to your asses. We're doing this. At one point, they started working with um, um, Mutt Langer, and I and I think that was at a period of time in when Mutt Langer. Uh, there was a period of time in Mutt Langer's career where he wouldn't take anything on unless it was a guaranteed nailed-on smash. 
just wouldn't waste his time with it. So he ended up working with people like Maroon 5, who, you know, Nickelback, just stuff that's already doing big numbers, but just do even bigger numbers. Um, he's an interesting producer because I think stuff that's too perfect, he doesn't like it. I've heard anecdotes of how, like, if you sing too perfect, he'll either make it flat or sharp so it pops out a bit. The opposite approach to those guys that just whack a load of auto-tune on everything and, and make it sound completely inhuman. If anything... Matt Langer's chasing humanity um, in, in a really strange sort of technological way. He always has the, the best equipment, um, but wants to make things that connect on a human level. Um, so it's really interesting that they worked with him. I think it's kind of like they don't need a hit. And I, I would imagine, since a lot of their material is self-produced, they probably wanted to be in a room with Matt Langer to learn from him. And then this album is is produced by muse itself and it's a fucking fantastic production it really is i think these guys this is like what i would call a return to form because since black holes and revelations i've heard stuff that's that's come through and it's kind of okay you can hear it's them it has their sort of signature sort of melodic choices and stuff but then you hear something like madness madness is swallowed for me, it's like, um, I don't like that song. I, I mean, I know a lot of people love it, but it's, for me, it just sounds like I want to break free, but nowhere near as good. And I don't know why they're operating with that sort of 12-bar blues structure when they can do this. And this is what they should be doing. This is Muse doing Muse in a way that nobody else can do it. It's distinctive. There's interesting chord changes. And you can imagine, you just imagine it live, kicking off. It's a return to form. And as a Muse enthusiast of sorts, you know, I'm, I'm quite selective in, in, in terms of which parts of their oeuvre I actually enjoy. But this is one of the ones that I think is really, really strong. So, well done, Muse. You're back. You're doing your best work again. This, is, this song could actually sit on Black Holes and Revelations. There's one bit I noticed in the middle which is really cool as well. Another little um, echo of something I'll just show you. <laughs> You know, sometimes there's a little bit of U2 influence in, in like the way he um, expresses, you know, certain phrases when, it, when he's singing. And then this bit in the middle, like, reminds me of, uh, what's that, what's the U2 one I'm thinking of? One of the big ones. Hang on. I'll just get it up. Huh? Get it up. I said that. It's got a little bit of an echo of U2's Sunday Bloody Sunday in the way the drum pattern goes. Hang on. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but there's just something about it that, that reminds me of it. And I think that they're always talking about stuff that, that alludes to wartime, um, terror, and, and just the overall sort of existential threat that surrounds us in this political climate of, uh, you know, divisive leaders. And, and basically, I think... I think if he's if he is to be the leader of a resistance of sorts, he needs to unite us and and uh, alert us to these people who are trying to divide us. I actually I actually think he's a really smart guy, but I would love to hear him getting a bit more direct about what he's trying to say geopolitically. Um, that's what that was what, what was great about you too. Like when they kicked off, they were literally talking about events in in Ireland and, and uh, the troubles and being really specific about stuff. And then I think as they got bigger, they sort of broadened it a bit to where the sentiment became, you know, bombs are bad. And that's the most obvious kind of sweeping statements that you can make. Children should be safe. And we know this, you know, but when, when they're really on fire, they're talking about really specific moments that, that, that resonate with all of us. Um, so, <clears throat> I mean, this is a huge band doing something that's... Uh, both personal and geopolitical. Um, but the other thing about that section, it reminds me of war. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Say it again. Love to hear Matt Bellamy doing a. So I'm excited to check out the rest of the album. Well done, Muse. Great work. Justin Hawkins writes a. Again. Now I can't resist doing the descending bit. Still, mustn't grumble. Don't forget, like, subscribe, sign up for the alerts and watch one of these two brilliant videos 
Um, see you in the rabbit hole. Lots of love and adieu.